Why God? Why God? Uh, I have good health. I make good money. I got a good family. Why do I need God? There, there are millions of people that are sitting home right now at Home Depot, cutting the grass, going to the pool, asking the question, why do I need God? Everything is going well in my life. I got good health. I got food on the table. Why do I need God? This is a question, guys, that we have to answer. Why do people need God? It's one of the questions that I've been asking myself all week long. How can we get someone that's sitting on the couch on their day off? How can we get them engaged and involved in this life that we call Christianity? This family, this fellowship of believers. How can we engage them? And how can we cause impact in their life that they'll see what we feel like is so amazing to us. This life that we live, this family that we have, it's amazing. And how can we get someone that takes their day off and says, you know what, I can't imagine going to church on my day off. I got things to do. I got places to go. Why? Why God? This is a question we got to answer, church. And there's various answers to this question because God can meet all needs. Let me say it again. God can meet all needs. Needs that you know you have and needs that you don't know you have. He is a need meter. And so we have to find out what are the needs of the people. We can't have some type of answer that we just kind of come up with on our own. We've got to find out what are the needs of the people and how our mighty God can meet those needs. And then we'll begin to engage people and begin to have conversations and participation with them and we'll begin to see and they'll begin to see, whoa, whoa, I've been missing out on this life of Christianity that's awesome and it's great and I've got a family that loves me. But there is one across the board reason to have God in our life. David said in in Psalms chapter 51, verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. David is saying here, I was brought forth in iniquity or shame or guilt or condemnation. I was born with shame, guilt, and condemnation. And uh, in my sin, my mother, or I'm, I have this propensity to always make mistakes. My mother conceived me with this sinful nature, and I, and I miss the mark, and I make mistakes all the time. I'm carrying around with me this shame and this guilt and this condemnation, and I always miss the mark. We find out in Romans 3.23. That Paul said, for all have sinned, all have missed a mark, all have made mistakes, all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory or the standard that God has set. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short of that standard. In Genesis 6, chapter 6, verse 5, God is describing the world, and he says that when I created the world, I I didn't know that man was going to be so evil and desperately wicked and that every evil intent of their heart was going to be wrong. And God even said in Genesis chapter 6, I regret even making man. Whether you know it or not, people are carrying around with them You may be in here today, some element of shame, 
some element of condemnation, some element of guilt, and some element of missing the mark and making mistakes. Today we live in a society that some people don't even want to take a risk and step out and do things because the, t the time they did that, they missed the mark. They failed. They made a mistake. And I don't want to do that anymore. We all carry around with us, church, some form of this guilt and shame and condemnation and failure. Why God? Why God? Well, we find out in Romans chapter 5. Turn there real quick. Romans chapter 5. Somebody shout, I believe. Romans chapter 5. Let's look at verse 6. Watch this. For, for when we were still without strength, we were helpless. We were powerless. We could not help ourselves. We're without strength. In due time or just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Notice it didn't say he died for someone that is godly or someone that is righteous or someone that does everything right or someone that's not carrying shame or guilt or condemnation. He, he didn't just die for someone that does everything right. It says here that he died for the ones that were ungodly, those that hate God, those that look nothing like God, those that are acting nothing like God. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one would die. Yeah, you might give your life for someone that does things right. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. You might attempt to die for someone that is good. But God, somebody say, but God. Oh, come on, say, but God. That means wipe out everything that was said. Watch what God does. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Some of y'all caught that, that while you were still a sinner, while you looked nothing like God, while you acted nothing like God, while you were an enemy of God, Christ died for you because God demonstrated his love to you. And he said, this is my love. I've got one gift to give, and it's going to be my best gift. It's going to be Christ, my only begotten son. And it's because I love you, I sacrifice my son for you so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. If you receive that, somebody say, I receive. Now, he... He sent Jesus, he, not because he was so angry at us, not because we deserved it, not because we were so gracious and kind, not because he felt sorry for us. Listen to me now. God demonstrated his love for us because he loves us. Now, now don't, don't let this be too simple for you. We, we want to earn it, and we want to deserve it. And God saw us in a condition that we were helpless and powerless and didn't have any strength. And he said, I, I don't feel sorry for them. No, no, that's not what he said. He said, I love them. And because I love them, I want to give them my best gift. I, watch this. I want to save them. Listen to me. I want to save them because I love them. I want to save them. They can do nothing for me. I want to save them because I love them. This is, this is so very important. Now go to Galatians chapter 4, I believe. Galatians chapter 4. And let's look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. So God sent Jesus, who was born of a woman, Mary, to this earth, born under the law. The law was present in the earth. Jesus was born under the law. Now watch this. Why was he born? To redeem, to purchase, to buy back, to redeem those who were under the law. That's you and I that we might receive the adoption. Somebody say the adoption. Somebody say adoption. 
that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Say this after me, Abba, Father. Abba is just a, it's an endearment term that just simply means daddy. Daddy. Abba, Father. Now go to Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 15. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Watch this. Paul says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. Somebody say adoption. Say adoption again. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, say it with me, Abba, Father. So the spirit of bondage wasn't given to you by God for you to receive. But what was given to you by God for you to receive is this spirit of adoption that we can in turn shout out, Abba, or I have a daddy, and he's my father. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, I believe. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 4. Now watch this. Now listen to these words. Matter of fact, I'm going to emphasize these words because I want you to see this. Just as he chose us. Did we choose him? Okay, let me, you're going, I'm working on something here. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Oh, this is good. Before you were ever even thought about. Before your mom and dad ever got together. Before the sperm met the egg. He chose you. That we should be holy. We're going to talk about that next week. And without blame before him in love. Having predestined. Now don't let this word scare you. It just simply means prepared beforehand. Prepared before. If I'm going to drive to Charleston, South Carolina, I'm just not going to hop in the car and start driving. I'm going to prepare. And if I'm going to stay tonight, I'm not just going to say I'm going to get a hotel when I get down there. I'm going to get me a hotel before I go. I'm preparing beforehand. He's saying here he predestined or he prepared beforehand us to adoption. Somebody say adoption. As sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure, watch this, of his will. Now look at me. Let's say I'm a, I'm a trillionaire. Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. I received it. I, let me get that in the atmosphere, praise the Lord. And let's say I'm a trillionaire. And let's say, now imagine with me, you're drowning in the ocean. No one's around. I come up in my boat. Let's just call it a yacht. Come up in my yacht. I see you, I see you drowning. I got a lifesaver. Now, because of my grace and my kindness, I, I, I could keep the yacht moving. But because of my grace and kindness, I throw the lifesaver over. And because of your faith in that this lifesaver will save you, 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 you grab a hold of this lifesaver. And, and, and then I, I, I pull you in. I don't have to. You don't, you, I don't know if you deserve it. I don't have to. I, I just want to. I don't know you. You're, you could be an enemy to me. You could hate everything I stand for. You can do everything wrong. I, I don't know what you've done. But I see you drowning. I throw my lifesaver out. You grab a hold of it by faith. That's just my grace, throwing the lifesaver out. You, and, and I pull you in, and I get you in the boat, and you say, thank you for saving me. I was dying. I was lost. I was drowning. Whether you knew you were not drowning or not, maybe you think you're an Olympic swimmer and you was going to somehow get back to the land. No, you was drowning. 
and my grace was just sufficient to get, provide you salvation. So you were saved. You're in my yacht now and you're saved. Hallelujah. Now, just it, that by itself would be fine. But I want to go a step further. You know what? I love you. So you're standing in my boat. I'm a trillionaire. I got a yacht. I love you. Y you know what? I, I want to make you my son or daughter. But but you don't you don't know me. Uh, you, I was just drowning. No no. I by my grace and kindness, I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want to give you every right and privilege that I have, every place of position that I have. I want to give you access to my bank accounts. I select you. I select you. I, guess what? I accept you just the way you are. You're dripping wet, and I know I just saved you, and I know you're crying, and I know you're excited about this being saved because you were dying, but I want to go a step further. I accept you, and I want to support you. I'm a trillionaire. Everything is going to be all right. I ain't ever going to run out of money. Adoption says, the right to give of your privileges, of your benefits, of your responsibilities, of your rights, of your place to someone, a son or daughter that was not a son or daughter by birth. Glory, hallelujah. I'm telling you what, what almighty God did for you and I. He not only just saved us, that would have been all right. But he didn't just save us, he adopted us. And he says, no, 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 I select you. I chose you. I accept you. You're mine. I'll support you. I, you're a son. You're a daughter of the most high God. I thought you'd be a little more excited about that. But I know I'm a son and daughter of the Most High God, and he's taken me and supported me and took care of me. Not only did he save me, but he provides for me. I can use his name wherever I go. And when the demons come, I said, no, no, no. In the name of Jesus, my big brother, you can't stay in my life. God is my father, and everything he says will be done. So I put my words and his words words in my mouth and I declare everything is going to be all right because my father loves me. I don't just have a savior anymore. I have a father. He said, I'm your daddy. I've given you the spirit of adoption. You just call me daddy. We need to watch when we pray and stop saying Lord God so much and start saying father. Oh, I don't, I don't know him by Lord God anymore. I know him by Father. He's my daddy. I've got an intimate relationship with him. Somebody else, you just may know him as God, but I know him as Father, and I'm tired of people putting bad things on my father. My father ain't done all this stuff that you said he's doing. He ain't killed all them people like you said. My father loves me. The spirit of adoption has been received, and you stand there and you say, why would you want to do all that for me? You, I was just drowning here. You, you don't know what happened. I killed somebody, and I jumped in this ocean to get away, but you still came up in your yacht, and you still drug me out. And now you want to give me all of your rights and your privileges and all, you, and all the benefits, and, and you want me to call you daddy? I don't understand. You don't have to understand. It's my grace. You don't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's my grace. And I selected you. Before you even ended up in this drowning ocean, I chose you. Mm. Be, be, before, you before you were even in this predicament, I accepted you. The number one greatest need of humanity is to be accepted. We all want to be accepted. We want to be accepted just the way we are. 
and we're willing to change after you accept me the way I am. But see, we, Christianity, which is not like God, what we've done is we've said, you've got to change first, and then I'll accept you. No, 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 no. God, God never said that. I'll accept you just the way you are, and I'll take you just the way you are, and I chose you just the way you are. And I'll support you just the way you are. And when you begin to see all of the rights and privileges and benefits of the Most High God, you won't stay the same. You'll begin to act like a son or daughter and say, sons don't act like the way I'm acting. Daughters don't act like the way I'm acting. i got a rich father who loves me. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you. Just lift up your hands right now and say, thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Say, happy Father's Day. Glory to God. Thank you for adopting me. Thank you for saving me. Glory. Hallelujah. For selecting me and choosing me before I was ever born. Oh, I'm a son and daughter, and you love me. You love me. You love me. So my mom had me right out of high school. Around 18 years old, when she was 19, I was born with her high school sweetheart. I, I was. That's, she laughed because that was many, 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 many years ago. At the time, I am a candidate for abortion. Listen to me now. Poor. In Mississippi, she gets pregnant. Aren't you glad she didn't have an abortion? <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Now, in Mississippi, no one is, has money. She decides to have me. Well, obviously, the high school sweetheart and her never got together. She's a single mom. Statistics say, man, I, I should be in the hood somewhere, broke, busted, and disgusted. Matter of fact, I do remember living off Elm Street in the hood where the police helicopters flew twice a day. And I thought they were just trying to say, hey, no, they were searching with their light, looking for the bad guys. And my grandma had told me, my mom's mom had told me that if the light gets on you, it'll suck you up in the helicopter. <laughs> and I believed that for years. I probably was in high school before I stopped believing. And so I used to never let that light get me. It's going to suck. Now, I never saw any other kid get sucked up, but I don't know. For some reason, she told me that. That was her way of discipline. Who was in the hood? Some apartments off Elm Street. In the back corner somewhere, there was a dead end. Now, I don't know if y'all know, but if you got some apartments where there's some dead end, that's a, that's a horrible apartment complex. Any and everything was happening right on there. Somebody say, but God. My mom met a man. His name is Arnold Alexander. She's a single mom with a child. He looks at me, and he selects me. Now, they just dating. Who loved who first? He loved me first before I could even get a chance to love him. Are you listening to me? He selected me. He and my mom got married. He, he chose me. He said, I, I want to support you. Not, not because I was so good looking or, or I, had a, I was on my way to play NFL football or something. Like he somehow saw some potential that he might be in the NBA one day. He had no idea what I would end up doing. But he said, I love your mom and I love you. I select you. I choose you. I'll support you. 
He's a single man with no kids. He could have he went anywhere. But he, he said, no, I choose you. I was wondering why my last name was different. He said, you know what? I want to change his last name. I want to make him an Alexander. I don't, what can I do for him? I'm six, seven years old. What can I do for him? Nothing. Change his last name. I want to adopt him. I want to give him all my rights, all my privileges. I want to support him. Whatever is mine, I want him to have. I want to have an inheritance set up for him. I want to take care of him. I want him to be mine. I want to call him son, and I want him to call me daddy. I was looking at my birth certificate the other day. Pulled it out. And lo and behold, on my birth certificate, it says September 9th, 1977. I was born. It says September 10th, 1977. Arnold Alexander signed the birth certificate. Was he there? That boy's mine. I want to I wanna accept him. I want to support him. I want to take care of him. I want him to have my last name. That's my father. He loves me. Amen. He loves me. Exactly like our Heavenly Father, who says, I'm going to take you no good, knowing you might think you have everything going right in your life. You might think things are working out in your life, but what you're lacking is heavenly, spiritual, fatherly love. So you're sitting on the couch thinking everything's all right. You think everything's good, but I got a little money in the bank. Got a little health. Got a little family. Everything's all right. But there's a void that you have. Do you know that I would have always had the void of a father's love? My mom grew up without a father. The entire time she grew up without a father. The void of a father's love. My wife grew up without a father. He, he may have come a handful of times, but he wasn't there without a father's love. How many of y'all grew up without a father? Look, hands. Hands going up. But your heavenly father says, I want to love you. I want to support you. I want to take care of you. I want to accept you just the way you are. I want to remove all of your shame, all of your guilt. I want to remove all of that condemnation. I, I want to remove all of the curse that's in your life, that curse that said you ain't ever going to amount to nothing. I want to remove it. I want to break some statistics that say if you grow up without a father, nine out of ten times you're going to end up in prison. Oh, no, I didn't say that right. Nine out of ten prisoners grew up without a father. Nine out of ten. God says, I want to be your father. Would you let me support you? Would you let me take care of you? My dad's been my dad since I was six. That's my dad. All rights and privileges his. His. He's, he's given to me. Was I because I'm so great? No. It's because he selected me. And he chose me. If you are a believer in this house today, I don't want you to think you're so awesome and so great. God selected you. And you did nothing to earn it or deserve it. Now, the great thing about him, he selected everybody. But only some of them are going to receive it. I could have I acted a fool. That ain't my daddy. 
Get him out of here. Get that man out of this house. That man could have said, you know what? I ain't got time for that. <laughs> You've been selected and chosen to be a son and a daughter because you were not born a son and daughter. You were born in iniquity and sin. And through the adoption process or the salvation process first to save you from that and then the adoption process to now make you a son or daughter by birth. You get all the rights and privileges as if you were Jesus. Listen to me now. John 17, 23 says this, literally says, Jesus is praying here. Matter of fact, I want you to turn there. I want, I want you to put your eyes on there. Turn there. John 17, 23. Glory, hallelujah. Watch this. Jesus says, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved them. I said it, I, I read it backwards. Let me read it this way. And you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So Jesus is saying here to the disciples, not just the ones that are with them, but for you and I today, that he wants us to know that God's love for you and I is the same as God's love that he has for Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Go to, real quick, John 15, verse 16. Watch this. Jesus says here, you did not choose me. He's talking to you and I. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Understand this adoption process, guys. We, as the adoptee, do, do not have the opportunity to choose. The adopter chooses. And through his grace and kindness and undeserved favor, he looked at you and selected you. And he chose you. Now, what's our response? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, thank you. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, thank you, thank 